welcome to the Mike Clegg YouTube podcast. Today I'm really pleased to welcome Pat McGibbon. Clegg, how are you doing? Very good, Pat. So, me and Pat have quite a long history together. Pat was at Man United when I first turned up at the club all the, all the way back in 1993. And through our careers, we actually played together also at Wigan. Um, Pat's come along today from Northern Ireland. He's, he's flew out with us. So it's been, um, you know, thank you so much for doing that, Pat. You're welcome. Big commitment by yourselves. And we're going to talk about all things football, Pat's history, how we end up playing for Northern Ireland, um, how we end up be, uh, making hundreds of appearances for Wigan he played for Man United first team become a manager and now the great work he's doing with um, his own company self and foundation called Train to be Smart so Pat I really appreciate you coming and um, like I always do with my different um, people come on the show just tell us a little bit about your rich history in football and, and how it all began really because you're from Lurgan in, in Northern Ireland is that right they pronounced right. that yeah. right yeah you, you pronounced it right yeah. so I imagine as a young boy you, you <clears> first <throat> find this uh, pig's bladder, this football, and you're kicking it around with your mates at school, but you, 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 you're becoming passionioned by the sport. Yeah, I mean, I think I started as a, I think I've, I've got photographs of even a, a, in, in nappies where I was, I was kicking about a ball in the, in, in the grass just in the backyard, and so that's where it all started, really. Um, in terms of a first competitive game, I didn't play my first competitive game that, that was 11. I was playing a bit of, of Gaelic sport and Gaelic football in, in primary school, but when it came to, to actually soccer, then the, the first match that I would have played was at 11 in, in secondary school there. And at the same time I joined a club called Lurgan United and we had a great coach called Dazzy Bunker McGuinness and, and basically you know, we, we got the love for it from there. Yeah, I suppose all things like that, you were probably quite good at it, early doors, you got a good coach who's obviously bringing this team bond and maybe got a mother and father who really try and promote you doing something, you know, out for good for your health and well-being. Did you, did you go to a local park initially or was it a case of being a part of a team? Yeah, no, just initially, just, I just loved playing the game, so I was getting out, and uh, while I didn't see it as, as, you know, practice every time that you kicked that ball, it was repetition, so um, it was only then, as I say, I, I loved sport generally, so like I was into cross-country running, I played Gaelic football, I played soccer as well, I was, uh, you know, I was into anything that went, and I was just sporty as a person, and my dad was the same, although he ended up going into actually cycling, and cycled mm -hmm. for Ireland as well, um, that was his chosen sport, but because of that sport, was always around. Well that's interesting so again the rich history of sport within the family and obviously your father would have been very fit and knew about his own body and he's obviously got a son there who loves playing football and all different types of sports so I, I imagine it was you know a brilliant moment where as you start to see your development and you, you, you're a good player so you, you talked before a little bit you, you, who was your first proper team to play for so to speak then? Yeah so it was from 11 Lurgan United were the team that I played for up until I was 15 years of age and at 15 we, we, had, a, we had a good side so there were quite a few of the lads some of the, whom were were a year younger but we, we had a great group and at 15 years of age and I think there was maybe five or six of us uh, were invited then to Portadown who would have been the sort of part-time professional team okay. that was about 10 minutes away the, the first team manager actually came over and sat with my dad and said look we want to bring them over along I suppose with the, the other players but even at 15 years of age um, the the I was still quite small at the time. Yeah, really? so you're, yeah, you're well, I certainly. How tall are you now? Yeah, I'm six foot one and a half. So obviously, as a centre half, you needed to have that yeah. little bit of height uh, as well as as obviously being able to go and attack the ball. But uh, even I got up to the 15 years of age, and the, the Victory Shield team would be, you know, obviously mm. you would have England, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, and I got to the last 30 of it, but didn't progress beyond that. Um, now the only the only lad I think that ended up making a fairly long career in the, in the game that was in that squad would have been Stephen Lomas at that time. Okay. He obviously played for for Man City as well. And um, but the, the the other player that along with myself that ended up making careers in the game was a lad Jared McMahon from Lurgan who played in the same Lurgan United team as me yeah. and is now one of the coaches involved with Train to Be Smart as well. So it's a great story mm -hmm. and I think. During you know around that area, and that's why I, I always mention about Desi McGuinness and Bunker. Um, there was six full internationals came out of that um, uh, from that area, and I think there was an area of maybe twenty five thousand. Oh. So uh, I think there's a lot of attachment to the the coach within that. So he was obviously doing something really well there, and yeah, getting yeah. the boys to progress to a very high level. Yeah. Uh huh. 
Good, so then from 15 then you're maybe a little bit smaller, but I imagine your body grew, because by 18 you're at Man United. So in them three years, what happens? Are you eating your tuna and your spinach? Or? Yeah, no, you know what? Um, I think it, uh, as much as, uh, to be honest, I had sausage beans and chips a lot of the time. It was only I started eating more healthily as I went on. Yeah. But I always had a, had, had a really good belief system as well, Cleggy, and what went on. So when I, when I came to it from 15 through the 18, there were actually... Uh, two or three lads who happened to be my mates as well and we'd have went out and kicked in the, just in the local park when we weren't weren't training um, but they were in the Victory Shield team with obviously they, play, they actually played against Ben Thornley in, for Northern Ireland they played against Kevin Sharp who I was a, a teammate of at Wigan and they were a year younger than me so I couldn't get into Portadown's youth team at 16 years of age while they were getting in ahead of me oh. so that was difficult but my dad had a great you know great way with him and he says well look you know there's one way of making sure you you, you actually get into the team and that's by you working harder than them so we'd always really good advice and at sort of 16 and a half to 17 then the, the growth spurt went and I then sort of grew four or five inches and all of a sudden by the time I was 18 I was I was captain of the youth team which won the youth cup with Portadown nice. um, I, I was playing in the reserves I was on the fringe of the first team and it was at that stage then Eddie Coulter who was a chief scout at, at Man U came to, to watch me and from there I was offered the, the trial to go to Manchester United. <coughs> Did you know he was watching you? Didn't know, didn't know. I just uh, came in uh, about three or four weeks beforehand. Um, I'd been, uh, th there was the offer of like a, a trial to Port Vale, but that then fell through. And I was just playing a reserve match at, at Shamrock Park at the time. And um, as I say, after the game, Ronnie McFall, the first team manager said, look, somebody wants to speak to you. And then there was this man, Eddie Coulter, who, who brought quite a few and, uh, players from Northern Ireland, including Keith Gillespie over as well. Um, he said, look, we'd like you to go over on trial. So at that stage, it was like, wow. And uh, was you actually a Man United fan? Was the family of Man United or were they Liverpool? Yeah, or I mean, it? look, believe it or not, I'd, I'd grown up, and I'm not going to lie, I was a Liverpool supporter growing up, but you see when I got the... I know. <laughs> but you see when I got the Man U, it was the fabric of the club, it was the people, the whole environment, and that's what I'll talk about later on, yeah. is it was the whole environment, it was the people. I couldn't do anything but fall in love with the place. Of course, so I imagine you, did they fly you over, did you spend some time at the cliff, how, how was your, what, what, I always thought <coughs> about the first time I put that Man United strip on, that feeling, you know, what was it like for you? Yeah, I mean, uh, just amazing, I mean, even even on trial, just to go, and I I was going, remember, I was going from youth team level and, and OK reserve team level at Portadown, mm -hmm. I was going from there, um, to then, what I thought was going into like a B team or A team, because I was still that age, I could have played for, you know, at under 18. Um, um, but the gaffer ended up throwing me in the reserve team game against Aston Villa in my trial match <laughs> and it was Mark and Dwight York and Dalian Atkinson who sadly passed away and so they were the two centre forwards Wow, what a baptism <laughs> of fire that is, isn't it? Yeah, and ended up going in that and um, obviously did was, did well enough for them then to invite me they wanted me to stay over mm -hmm. after that week but I couldn't because of school I was still at my A-levels uh, but they invited me over then in the summer for, for the three weeks trial and it was after those three weeks then that, that the offer asked me to sign then for three years So it's under three year contract so at what age was you then then? I would have been 18 at that stage turning, turning 19 it was I think it was two months away from my 19th birthday So you're obviously a bright lad you were doing your A levels and uh, <coughs> as we continue the talk there's, the education has been throughout your entire thread of life but you signed three years at Man United three years prior you was a 15 year old lad who couldn't even get in, 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 the, in the port of down team so you, you must be thinking wow what a accelerated pathway that's been and you must have been proud as punch your family must have been made up with you but obviously the journey is just starting really uh-huh yeah i mean it, it was and i mean my dad again was was very level-headed and he tried to keep me level-headed and he says you know even going over here you're only on the first strong and he was totally right because you know what it's like you know how difficult the game it is yeah. and w once you go over there you know it's just there's so many players even especially in the first year or two that maybe get a one year pro and and then within that they're, they're just not deemed ready for the first team where they have to go down leagues and when you go down leagues 
it's not as simple as what people think, you know, because again, you're, you're playing for teams that play a certain way, you've got managers who have certain opinions on the game and they're maybe not the same as your own, so you have a lot of dynamics to that. So you're at Man United, you just signed, you've moved over, not only are you trying to deal with the pressures of playing and training with top players every day, so your body's adapting to that, you're also potentially homesick, but you have, you have a tragedy in the family, which again affects you massively, but also sets you up in life as having to have a certain amount of resilience. You know, are you, are you happy to talk about this? Yeah, yeah. Look, I mean, I've, I've spoken about it before, and it, it's something I have to say as we go further on with trying to be smart. It, it's my driver. It gets me up in the morning whenever people are. The situations are, are sort of getting me down or it's getting on top you know I always have this driving through so um, it was about eight months in to, to my first year at Man U um, obviously I was still getting over a lot of players you know moving away from home in a fairly you know far distance it wouldn't be classed as a distant big distance now yeah, but at yeah. the time um, so I was within digs with with quite a few lads that, that you'll know, um, but I was at training and then after training, then I had to go back to the digs. So the landlady was Brenda Gosling, who was who was terrific, I have to say, with with myself. Um, but she told me to sit down and then and basically told me then that my brother had taken his own life at that stage. So it was eight months in, which was obviously a very difficult thing to to deal with. Oh, that's a massive tragedy. It's hard at any point. I mean, I lost my my grandfather, and he was eighty three. That's hard to deal with. But to lose your brother mm -hmm. uh, must be very, very, a very difficult time. Um, so, I mean, did that affect the way you felt about life in general, or your football career? Was it something what become secondary, or did you just, just use that therefore as a as a, as a driver for your own <coughs> training? Well, I think it was it was coming towards the end of that season. As I say, it was in, in April. It was April the thirteenth, and it was uh, at that stage then the gaffer obviously. I went home and, and had to deal with the work, the funeral. But at that stage, my mates at 18 had, had moved on. They were going to university, they were doing their own thing. So football was, was everything to mm -hmm. me. So when it came to it, the gaffer gave me as, as much time as I, I wanted. But, you know, as I said, after a couple of weeks, to be honest, I was doing nothing mm -hmm. anyway. So it was much better to, to concentrate on something. So the one thing I would say after that is it put in everything into perspective, you know, and, and, you know, football, and we'll come on to it a wee bit further on. But, you know, things that have happened in my football career, which were, you know, what has been a roller coaster, you know, ups and downs. You know, all careers are, though. Yeah, exactly. So you get back, you concentrate on football again. You're playing for the reserves, Man United, quite a lot. Yeah. Um, talk about in and around that time, who, who was in your squad, what was your learning, and ultimately you end up making your first team debut. But tell us, first of all, the build up to the first team debut and um, what it was like within that sort of interim period. Yeah, I mean, after after obviously my first year in settling in, I think the second year was was difficult enough as as well. But I suppose with with what had went on before, again, confidence had, had drained a bit. You know, I suppose there, there was a lot of dynamics there. But then um, I was playing in the reserve team and doing doing well within the reserve team. Then and he obviously had backs, he had skulls, he had all of that great so coming through. Yeah, great. Must be some older, older players remnants left there. Yeah. Well, look, Dion Dublin, Dion was yeah. there at the time, and and Mike Phelan, Mike was there. You had um, you had a lot of you know experienced people around as well, but. Um, you also had those young dynamic lads who, you know, obviously came up, went on to make absolute stunning careers yeah. um, th there as well. So, you know, we won that we won the league within the reserve league, and um, we, we're starting to come within the fringes of things. So I think we went to Rada Volgograd, and, mm -hmm. and I was within the squad in it, and obviously wasn't in the 18 but then was told that I was was going to be in the uh, I was going to play in the game against York in the, the Coca-Cola Cup then so 95 um, so build up to it obviously it's a massive you know it's a, a massive honour um, and played the game went 1-0 down but still well within the game you know we had quite a few young lads and so so sorry to jump in but yeah. so prior to the game against York you knew that he was playing or did it come as a surprise well it was it was only just before okay. you know it was only just before the, the game and again yeah. how did that make you feel because for me again it was like oh my god it's, you're almost scared to death but elated at the same time yeah, that yeah. you need to try and focus because you've got a big game coming up and that's right there's a, there is a, there's a nervousness there but you have to try and control that nervousness 
process and focus on, on the, the game itself you know so we're going in with a group and obviously you've some young lads in there and, and, and Pilks Pilks is a, is a good mate of mine and, and so that's Kevin um, Pilks yeah, in the goalkeeper yeah, yeah so he was in there we, we had some senior players with so Pally played alongside me and like myself and Pally as much as we knew each other we hadn't played as a partnership mm. and you know at times that especially within defensive partnerships and even I suppose attacking partnerships as well you have to get to know people so um, like I had, had a great relationship with with Chris Casper and the reserve team when, when they were in for a while when we won the league yeah. and that that's established through time really so um, but went into that game and obviously went 1-0 down went into the second half about 15 minutes in and um, we tried to play offside got it wrong had to chase back ended up taking Paul Barnes down outside the box and it was all it was shown to be outside the box but um, the linesman gave a penalty and I got sent off from it so so that's a, a <coughs> without <coughs> saying anything to dis- that's a nightmare so yeah. it's a nightmare for uh-huh. you you made your debut your family probably so proud you've been working all your life for this moment in time you get sent off uh-huh. it's a penalty and the, t- the team lose as well at the, yeah. at the end, you know. so how, d- how did you deal with that then you walking off that pitch is something that I never got sent off but to be walking off that pitch I mean emotionally again because I, I think well, this is why football is such a great sport is the amount of emotion which it sort of brings up for players and fans but what was it like walking off the pitch knowing you know that potentially uh, your your decision mm. of playing offside making that the foul being sent off thinking what's Alex Ferguson going to say to you you know, how, how did you deal with that? Yeah, look, look, it was difficult, and and I think at a club like Man U, and I know the, the even in the first year that I was there, they did the like some media training and mm-hmm. things like that. So, um, they try and and cater for it as, as much as you can. But obviously, when you're out there in that raw environment and there's supporters around you, I have to say, when I was sent off, the, the supporters were actually really good. The Man United supporters were really good. Um, obviously, in the changing room, the gaffer had a few choice words, but that's again, you know, the fact that um, I, my job was obviously to, to, to make sure there was defending properly when it came to it then the following morning and everything had cooled down he called me into the office and obviously had, had, had encouraging words and again that's what the, the, the really good thing about that time is mm. went out did the warm down and you had all the group of lads there and you had Brucey and all the senior players and they were they were just making a joke of it, and it was just part and parcel. It it's very difficult when it's in front of you know so many people, and then obviously you have the the world's press goes around it, and even you know twenty five years on they'll bring it up. But the the me it, as I say after what happened to Philip, it, it just builds up that resilience factor, and it's how you, how you deal with it. I suppose is the most important thing. Yeah, but again, I suppose it's on your mindset and what happens for the rest of your career. You can use that as something which can crush you or something what can make you. But ultimately, how long do you stay at Man United after this point? Um, I stayed another, it was another couple of years after that. What, what happened was that was 95, 96. Not, it was actually a, a few months later then we uh, I was involved again within the first team I was I was I think I was substitute for the the Newcastle game and I think they were running for that was between Kevin Keegan yeah, that that, that particular one. year and the, 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 I was actually on the, the bench f- for that game um, so it wasn't that the gaffer didn't have confidence and and the, the, they didn't have confidence in putting me back in but at that stage I think they went one 0 down at, against Newcastle mm. and. Maisie got injured at the time David May got injured now it was such a big environment and it was even at that stage they were one of the two teams that were going to win the league yeah. so um, the gaffer had to make a decision when Maisie came off just before half time and I always remember it and then um, I was warming up and he ended up sticking Kino in the centre back Okay. and you know I was disappointed because I was the one that wanted to get out there and and go again, but it it didn't happen. I always remember that the story was, Kino went on, first of all he he ended up, um, he was man of the match, he ended up (laughs) scored one of the goals. Kino, you could have put him in goal and he'd have been the best player, he was just that focused on on what he did. But I always remember, I thought to myself, I actually spoke to my dad after the game and I said, look, what was his answer me being in centre half, uh, you know, on the bench, if... Um, they weren't going to play him. So he says, "Well, 
you know, that's up to you to go and find out from the gaffer. So I went in the next morning. Okay. And to be fair to him, whilst he could have chased me out of the room, he basically said, look, you know, you're still inexperienced. Roy Keane, you know, is, is an experienced in that position. So we had to make a decision. And he was proved perfectly right. And that's, you know, that's why the gaffer is so successful. Yeah, of course, we both know the manager and he, he gets decisions right most mm -hmm. of the time. And um, obviously for you yourself, you end up leaving Man United after a couple of years and you make a real good career for yourself. And one of the highlights, I suppose, is, is being at Wigan. I, I ended up coming to Wigan myself and um, I played a couple of games um, with you. Um, but tell us about your Wigan career and did that feel like a big step down or did you really feel you got established as a player and therefore it, it really bolstered your sort of confidence yeah. in the way you felt about yourself? Well I think my, my final year at Man U, what, what happened was in my final year at Man U I was actually had broken back into the first team squad and I was in, I'd played in the pre-season friendlies mm. then the gaffer sent me out on loan to Swansea okay. who was managed by Jan Mulby at the time. Played one game for Swansea against Doncaster but then the way it worked I was training at Man U. Um, for three of those days and then travelled down to Swansea. Okay. So in the, 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 I think it was a Wednesday I was training and went in for a tackle with Ronnie Walwork with Ronnie okay. and I went in and was probably too honest went into the side my knee went the opposite way oh, tore, tore my medial tore my cartilage I was out for five and a half months yeah. of that year and it was then when I was recovering from there then I was sent out on loan to Wigan so I went for the first few games, I was, I was still only coming back from injury really, so the first couple of games it was a bit stale, but gradually got bad, better and better. So while it started alone, 96-97, uh, ended up scoring the goal that got them promoted against Colchester, yeah. and then won the league with, with Wigan, with the team that sort of had the, the likes of Roberto Martinez, Robbie was one of my teammates sir. Um, and then at the end of that season United offered me two years Did they really, yeah? but Wigan offered to buy me so I had to make a decision went and spoke to the gaffer about it and he says look you know it's important that you go and get first team football so I made that decision to, to go to Wigan yeah and I suppose some players even myself you can sometimes stay at a club for too long mm -hmm. and obviously Man United they're bringing in players like Yap Stam big superstars and you're always going to potentially have you know the amount of game exposure um, you know not as much as you want so making that move for you to go to Wigan you obviously almost become a cult hero in that sense there and you enjoyed your time there didn't you obviously when I was there and I was playing it was like Pat McGibbon he was the Pat McGibbon show yeah well look I mean uh, there, there were some great players there I have to say although we were like in League 1 we, we played in the playoffs three times in the five years of Azura we played in a playoff final we're, we're 2 1 up with I think seven minutes to go in extra time and with Kevin Sharp Kevin got sent off and ended up um, we, we lost 3 2 they, oh. they, they scored Gillingham scored in the last couple of minutes so we could make that we, we were, were basically a championship team with some really good players within that group um, so I really enjoyed my time with over 200 games within the club and as I said there was some really good players a lot during that time and what age did you stay there till? I stayed there until I was 20, it turned 29 I was, yeah. But what's interesting regarding Pat and regarding, we started speaking earlier about education. Well, she was at Wigan, you decided to start doing a, a physiotherapy degree, didn't you? So yeah. talk us through the thought process there, because there's this, <coughs> this debate at this moment in time whether um, young football players, even like lads in the 20s and 30s, should they be starting to think about what to do post-career or just concentrate 100% on their actual football career because it's hit there and now. But I think you took a wise choice mm -hmm. um, because of all the potential free time you get. So you did like, well, tell us about your course and why you did it and what it was. Yeah, I mean, I had, as I said, did my A-levels before I went to Man U, so I had them sitting and I knew when I got to, to sort of 25, 26 when I moved to, to Wigan Athletic, I wasn't going to be sitting in, in such a comfortable position that I didn't have to worry about mm. you know, finance afterwards. So you know, I went and I, I did the physio degree while I was still playing um, and there were some great characters around that group even within the degree. Paul Lake, Lake he was there, he's, he's become a good friend and he actually talks about mental health issues himself, Lakey, and yeah. has written a book about it. Um, so I, I just decided to do that degree while I was still playing. The PFA had funded it, which was terrific, mm. and it was sort of afternoons and evenings, which meant that after I trained for, for Wigan on, uh, on the Mondays, Thursdays, I could then go and do that. It was a wee bit difficult in terms of the summers because after I'd finished playing, 
then I had to go and do my placement, like a 12 week placement, so I got very little in the way of holidays, but that was a sacrifice that I had to make in order to get the physio degree. So when you did your placement, did you do that at like a hospital? I did, yeah, I just did that at Wigan Infirmary then, so I did the, the what, placement. What was the learning curve like there from, you know, football training in the mornings and so 12 week placement, yeah. I imagine that the hours were long, you're trying to take in all this information, physiotherapy is very clinical, you, you're on a bed, it's yeah. not much in the way of, um, you know, bigger environment it's, it's quite one-to-one -one. so how was that you know even when you did for yourself yeah well it was a change from the sporting environment because especially when you go to a hospital setting mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of physiotherapy work that's not just you know sports related so you've got your respiratory you've got your neuro you've got you know the, all, all of those different facets to it um, and obviously because of my background it was very sports sports related and um, so Th those parts of it you still have to see and you still have to be prepared for uh, so it was a good you know it was a grinding mm. and probably for the, the next step it, it sort of focused me on where I wanted to go with it. So I imagine you wanted to go to the sporting route with your physiotherapy and once you finished at, at Wigan because you was there how many years was you at Wigan? That was five years at Wigan. Five yeah. years where did you go then and did you take that physiotherapy degree with you to start practicing mm. uh, as, as a side job or as your actual main income? I think it, it, I was I was in my final year at Wigan. Paul Jewell had taken over as manager, and, and Paul had, had decided. Well, it was we we had spoken at the start of the season. See, Bruce Brucey had been in as, as manager yeah. the, the season before, and I had spoken to Brucey about getting a new contract because I was playing basically all the games, and there was, there was an agreement in place, or certainly with with Steve and, and the club and myself. Well, as far as I was aware, but then obviously Paul Jewell came in, did his own thing. And I spoke to him and said, look, I've got a year left, I've got a family, so I need to know where I'm going. And he says, look, at the minute, I'm not offering you anything. So at that stage, I said, well, look, I have to put myself on the list then because I have to look after my family. Mm. So I had to look at it from that, that point of view. Um, so that year then I went out and loaned the, the Scunthorpe under Brian Laws for a, for a spell. Um, then at the end of that year, then stepped away from Wigan and went down to Colchester, trained. Um, Burnett dad at the time was had developed Alzheimer's very young at 15, that was my wife. So, okay. And at that stage then, I was playing a Tranmere just locally on a short term contract, but ITV Digital had the, that had fallen through all the funding. Okay. So I had to make a decision, I'd been offered a couple of years at, at Portadown playing part time and I'd also finished my physio degree. So, and Burnett dad wasn't so well, so at that stage we made a decision then to, to move home. I could have stayed for another two, three, four years. Uh, certainly uh, was, was able to deal with that and looking back now the full time end of it suited me more than even part time because I, I just of anything when I went back for a while I was demotivated and I suppose a lot of the stresses of moving back home there was a lot, the, a lot of dynamics going on there as well. Yeah I suppose you, you move into a new team which is always quite difficult, it's gone part time you're mm -hmm. trying to set up your own business, did you work as, as your own business or did you work within um, some type of company when you were doing your physio? You know, I ended up, I applied for jobs within the NHS yeah. but there was very little going on Okay. and because of that then I did set up then part time right. set up just a sports injury clinic and, and so I was doing that part time and playing part time as well for Portadown at that stage Okay, so then you end up having a good couple of seasons playing over there, mm -hmm. um, and then you even end up becoming a manager. So, you know, was you still doing your physio through all that period of time as well? How, how did you, you combine the two? Because there's a lot of pressures on you. Yeah, I mean, uh, after a couple of years of Portadown, I then went to, to Glentorn, and Glentorn ended up we won, we won the league. It was a it was a big ambition for me to when I went back home to win an Irish League medal before. Then, but so, yeah, so I went and I did that, um, but the following year then. There was a dispute with, with the, the, the club and myself and at that stage then I stepped away so I'd already been going through my badges at that stage what I found with the physio and I knew very early on was that it was almost too clinical for me okay. and I was used to a changing room environment, I was used to football, I was used to all of the dynamics and mm. uh, as well as that I suppose looking back at it now um, Philip's death probably had a lot to do with it. I know it was a being a caring person but after Philip's death you know especially from a mental health perspective it was almost you're almost looking at people's body language and what's happening and just for that I suppose fear of so from from there obviously then went into coaching and management and 
that evolved from level one right through to my pro license so I'm now a pro license coach as well and, and went in yeah. through from Lurgan Celtic locally just as player manager that transition to manager went as assistant to Monaghan United for a year and a half down in, in, in Southern Ireland and then ended up then managing Newry City um, and that was a terrific time I have to say in Newry City and then managing at Portadown as well. <coughs> Yeah, I spent a bit of time in Newry myself, believe it or not. Yeah. Uh, there's a GPS company called Stat Sports. I don't know where yes, they're They've got them, yeah. the, uh-huh. a big setup there, and uh, I respect them guys. I've worked with them quite a bit over the years. So, yeah, a little bit of uh, a few meals in Newry <laughs> over the time. But you also did some lecturing at the Technology College as well, did you? Yeah, yeah, I did it in the, the local tech. I was doing like a sports coaching program along with, with the work that I was doing for Newry City. But unfortunately, at that time, it was. I found myself becoming demotivated. Mm. Uh, you know, I was used to motivated people, mm. and if anything, the the demotivation was was probably driving on or was affecting myself. And I was becoming more demotivated, yeah. and it was you know, and that's why when I go and do my talks, which I'm doing more and more of now, you know, talk about sort of positive role models and you know the amount of such successful people that I've met along the way, you know, and and that was a, a difficult time, but it it has almost led me to where I am sort of with the charity yeah things. so with the charity now you, in 2013 you set up train to be smart mm-hmm. and that's obviously your passion and that's your drive and you've obviously got um, ambitions with this and you're trying to um, help lots and lots of people so tell us about um, the, the train to be smart and where you want to take it and, and ultimately how, how you're benefiting people yeah well initially it started again you know my, I went right back to core values obviously you know Philip was very important and, and the death of the, the tragedy that's fell up I'm trying to do something positive out of what it was a negative situation and um, you know the core val- values of sport and education are, are within there as well mm-hmm. but it started off as a coaching program but then a lot of parents asked me would have set up teams and um, the, the charity promotes positive mental health through sports so we're, we're still in our infancy we still have you know we've no pitch of our own although we, we've actually partnered with a school to develop a pitch now so that's brilliant and we're, we're pushing for funding with that which is a very slow burner um, especially when you're sitting with 200 kids who who we want to be working at a sort of mental health level as well and you know so there's a lot of dynamics with that but it started off where initially it was trying to be smart was the smart was specific measurable achievable realistic and timed and obviously with my work in sort of even with within physio and the clinical aspect of it but also within the college you have that but one thing that you can't um, measure is self-esteem and I'm actually doing a mental health and well-being coaching diploma through Mindways at the minute just locally right. which I'm going to be qualifying in fairly soon and it, it's been really good because it's a whole holistic approach now to it so it was that whole self-esteem is, is so important and, and having that right environment which I think at United the, the, the gaffer fostered during those successful times as well. Yeah, I think the great thing for you, you've been in, in environments where that culture has been in place and when you get into the general public, you want to try and you know allow people to um, see and feel what that was like. Mm-hmm. But even yourself, from retiring, I know myself, you know, there's some very bad statistics out there, like 85% of players either go bankrupt mm-hmm. or um, get divorced and mm-hmm. a lot of them also have health issues. And How did you find retiring? You know, did, did you find um, you, you dealt with that easy enough or did, did you go through any issues yourself? Yeah, I, look I find it difficult to find that transition from a player which was just what I wanted to do and, and, and I suppose you know, even after Philip's death was, was something that kept me sort of focused and the, 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 w- between the roller coaster that you get you know, within the, with all the games and you win go- one game and you lose another mm-hmm. but within all those emotions but there's there's that tribal feeling and, and you know all the group there's a really good group both that, and man you know, I have to say at Wigan Athletic for five years there was a great fabric I mean Dave Whelan Dave's hard but he's fur mm-hmm. and I've always, I always found him that way so there was a great fabric with those clubs and um, whenever then I stopped in that transition from playing to then going into management you almost it's almost like losing losing a family yeah. you know and that that was difficult and as I say as much as physio was something still related to sport it was too clinical for me 
and I find it tough you know so it's just a, a, I wasn't training as hard as I should be I wasn't eating the way I should I was drinking more than I should there was a lot of issues going on there but it all related to the fact that I wasn't passionate enough about what I was doing because I was used to finding my passion with football and then working towards it mm. so it was only really when trying to be smart started that then everything started to lift and obviously you know it's still a there's, there's an awful lot of work to be done within the project and a lot of it surrounds funding in order to get us to where we want to do so obviously funding is something which you want to, to, to get and the people can be out there watching this, you know, how can Pat, you know, maximise that potential so he can help people through his experiences. But um, Roy Keane come over to um, one of your uh, charity events and he, he put forward his own, um, his welcome and he tried to help you out, did he? Yeah, I mean, Roy, Roy was terrific, you know, I hadn't spoken to, to Roy probably in about 13, 14 years at that stage. Um, I hadn't met him when I was at Wigan, I'd went back to see the new trainer ground at Carrington yeah. and Roy was training with the kids at that, that day. I think Ollie might have been as well and always remember because I was never one for going and, and letting them be known that I was watching. I was just standing out the side and then once training was over I just headed but Roy actually collared me and so did Ali ended up coming over as well and just asking how things were and it was typical of them. So it was actually through a friend of mine Tom Owen who was under 21 Republic manager okay. at the time. Um, the gaffer had agreed to come over but then couldn't due to a prior arrangement and had agreed then later on to come over. So Alex Ferguson. Yes, yeah. yes. And I needed then to, at that stage, to have somebody to, to drive something forward with the, the charity in terms of the profile. Mm. And it was made contact through the, the under 21 Republic manager and I got a phone call and I didn't actually answer the call. It was a private number and they ended up, then he left a message and said, it's Roy. Um, uh, would you give us a ring? So I phoned him back and I told him about it. Roy joined the club the year after, so the, the year after Philip took his own life, so he didn't know about Philip's death. But whenever I told him about it, he says, look, I'll do it for you. And came over, paid his own flight, never never took a penny. And, you know, the, the people will, you know, make their own opinions of Roy Keane. But, you know, at that stage, I was putting 50, 60 sometimes 70 hours a week wow. and did voluntarily Cleggy to the detriment of my physio mm. but I just had this belief that there was something really important in what what we were doing and you know whenever Roy came he obviously made uh, you know a few quid for the for the charity itself which has allowed me and if anything it revalued me yeah. the fact that somebody as big as that ended up was prepared to do it you know? I'm so interested about Roy and Roy is, <coughs> for me he took me to Sunderland when he was the manager so I was the head of strength and conditioning there as people know but it's them little things what people don't know about Roy and that's yeah. why Roy is within the community the people who know Roy is, is sound people love him out in the general public world they just sometimes see the harsh side of Roy and the, the very sort of forthright Roy but for yourself there to get Roy to come over and it does it gives you that buzz around what you're trying to achieve and, and now uh, where you've took it to the next level again you, you're going out now doing a lot more public speaking um, so tell us about some of the projects you've gone you've got this on your, on your band on your hand and yeah. So tell us what you're doing, and, and to finish off, you know, what is it you want to try and achieve with what um, with all your plans? Yeah. So I mean, the, the wristbands at the minute are it's the sign is it's smart to talk. So basically, the the smart system, which was specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and timed, turned around to sharing my anxieties, relieve tension, because mm. it was basically only speaking about Philip and the traumas that I had that everything, a lot of things lifted. So what I do is at the minute we're still in our infancy and because of that yes we would love to run more workshops mm. but a lot of the time I'm putting the message out there our kids have got the the wristbands like our 200 kids we want to then be at a stage where we can run workshops where they're prepared and able to, to speak out more and um, we don't have the mechanisms in place within the charity in order for them to be able to signpost to all these people because mm. I'm basically the only employee and that was through an outside company to do that so the ideal scenario is that we can put the mechanisms in place so that we then have the people that the children can be signposted to and the vulnerable and mm. um, so we 
we have kids from seven years of age through to, to 17 we've also got I would help with a kickback program which is for unemployed and underemployed okay. and we want to set up a mental health therapy team we you know it's it's because I obviously found it and I'm driving it I've said I don't really want it to be about setting up a senior team because I want it to be more about learning character skills and building resilience and sometimes I think uh, the parents have a, a, a big role to play in this sure. because you know, I think sometimes, especially our kids, get things too easy, and you know everything's construed as you know they're they're not getting their way, or you know, and and, and it's too easy for them to walk away. Whereas the one thing about my dad was my dad was well, if you want to achieve something, you have to be prepared to have the knockbacks and take the bad days before you get to see the real light at the end of the tunnel. Exactly, all the best things you've got to be willing to work for, sacrifice and you know so regarding um, the charity, um, trying to be smart, you know if you're in the local area of the, of the Lurgan is it? Yeah, uh -huh. um, definitely go down there, visit Pat, you know, try and help him, if anybody can make any donation to the fund that'd be fantastic to try and help him, what is a really good cause and something that's very topical at the moment, your know, mental health within our children, mental health within even ex-football players, it's, it's such a, a strong drive at this moment in time so please assist in that you know part, if people want to get in, in touch or people want to see more of what you're doing do you have a website have you got like a Twitter handle you know what, what can you tell people so they can really try and get this snowball effect a bit more momentum yeah I mean we've, we've obviously got our, our Facebook page which is trained to be smart juniors and um, the, the trained to be smart juniors Twitter feed is, is me basically so a lot of you know what I'll be doing will be on that and um, we've also got the, a YouTube channel so the trained to be smart YouTube channel we had obviously Roy over in February 2016 we've got clippets of it but we've we have an absolute absolutely great video of just you know Roy Roy doing the evening and he was terrific on the evening and um, so we're going to be putting out more pieces of it within the YouTube channel so train to be smart juniors is very important obviously the gaffer was over as well so Sir Alex was over and we've got pieces on it which are going to be going out we also did which is very topical for Northern Ireland and especially in the, the environment that Northern Ireland's in at the minute where we don't even have a, a government or any politicians sit within Stormont you know we had a um, we had a, a dinner in which Neil Lennon who's a, obviously a Celtic manager now caretaker manager of Celtic David Healy who was at Man U when I was there and, and play, yeah and yourself and you know there's now Linfield manager and Roy Carl and again you know Roy as well Cleggy it ended up um, they did a dinner and during that dinner it was just a fun dinner and yes Lenny played for Celtic and, and David and Roy played for Rangers but it was about trying to bring things together because especially in our country a lot of mental health problems revolve around conflict the conflict mm. and it's, it's probably the, the, the biggest legacy of mental health issues then Oh, brilliant, Pat. And all I can say is please support the cause, guys. And Pat, thank you very much for coming on the no, show. Thanks, and um, I'm sure I'll on. hopefully be able to come over to Ireland and Northern Ireland myself at some point and um, support what you're trying to do. So thank you very much, Pat. Great stuff. Thank you.